Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, hello. Uh, tonight, I did see that there are a few people that are visiting, as well as some new people. So I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Josh Rodriguez. Uh, I get the privilege of serving uh, one of a number of staff uh, that are here at the Indian Holy Church of Christ. And so I want to welcome you uh, to our Sunday night service, uh, Paradox. And so we're glad that you're here uh, tonight. I want to recap a little bit of what's been happening in the last few weeks. Uh, in the last few weeks and in the past month, we've been going together uh, through a, a sermon series and teaching through the book of Jonah. How many of you uh, enjoyed uh, taking that time to learn a little bit about Jonah? What did you guys think? Not too bad? Okay. We spent a few weeks in the, the sermon uh, title series, I guess what I would call that, is we embrace this idea of relentless grace, that God is a relentless God that pursues us and that he has an even greater relentless uh, grace that comes after us. And behind you, I don't know if you saw those, but we had a few symbols up on that wall over there that reminded us of Jonah's uh, life journey. We went through kind of chapter by chapter and heard a little bit about his story. In three of those chapters of Jonah, we, were, we learned very quickly that there was a lot of drama. There was a number of twists and turns, and we just kind of followed along. And there, uh, there was probably some times where you really connected with Jonah. There might have been some other times when you just really shook your head at some of the things that he said, as well as some of the things that he did. And so within those three chapters, we got this picture of a person running away from God. We got this picture of Jonah thrown overboard and a great fish that would swallow him. Inside the belly of the fish, we actually have Jonah crying out and God would respond and extend his grace out to him. And then in chapter 3, we learn that Jonah gets a second chance. He gets to go again to that city of Nineveh. Nineveh being a very wicked, a very rebellious city. And there was Jonah was able to participate in one of the greatest spiritual awakenings and revival throughout all of history. And he was able to participate in that. And then we found out in chapter 4 that Jonah's heart really wasn't even in it. And so we learned all these things and got to know Jonah a little bit more. But then the, the book ends with this question. God asked Jonah, shouldn't I be concerned for this great city of thousands and thousands of people? And that question wasn't just for Jonah, but it was a question I think that we needed to wrestle with as well. Because Jonah had received all this grace throughout this short story of his faith journey in those four chapters. And God says, shouldn't Nineveh receive that same kind of grace? And so the question for us to wrestle with, are we going to receive grace or are we also going to extend that grace to others? Well, now we're going to shift gears a little bit. This month we're going to learn a little more and we're going to do that through the story in the book of Ruth. How many are you familiar? Is, is Ruth maybe one of your favorite stories in the Old Testament? We do have a couple people that that is your favorite. Is there, is there anyone in here that's not so familiar and you, you just kind of admit, I don't know a whole lot about the story of Ruth, okay? We have some people that, that are agreeing with that as well. Over the next couple of weeks, we're just going to go chapter by chapter, and we're going to learn some of her story. And, and I would think if we would do a little bit of comparison between the book of Jonah and the book of Ruth, I would say Jonah had a lot of drama, it had a lot of twists and turns, Jonah's story would probably be the kind of story that would be neat to see on the big screen. And you kind of wonder how they would do some of the special effects, how they would do some of the, the graphics and all that. The Book of Ruth would probably be the movie that was more like the movie of the year. Because there's some interesting things that happen with the plot and the characters within that story. And so a couple similarities that I want you guys to realize uh, between Jonah and the book of Ruth. Ruth as well, her story is recorded in the Bible and it's found in the Old Testament as well. Guess how many chapters Ruth is going to be? Four. We're kind of hitting the theme with some short books. Four chapters. So not only is Ruth going to be found in the Old Testament, it's going to be nice and brief, but there's going to be a lot of interesting twists and turns in there as well. A real good story and some pretty interesting drama there. But some of the things that there are going to be a difference in and what you're going to find in Ruth's story is going to be this. 
Jonah, Jonah was a follower of Yahweh. Jonah was an insider into, you know, kind of the culture of faith. He was a prophet. He understood that God was patient. He understood that God was abounding in love. And part of Jonah's story was that he did not want God to extend grace because he knew God, and he knew God's ways. Now, what's going to be a little different when we learn about Ruth, Ruth is an outsider. So Ruth's story is going to be introduced and brought in and welcomed into this culture and this family of faith. So maybe for some of you, uh, when you grow up, it was just kind of a habit. On Sunday morning, where were you at? You were at church. Where were you at on Sunday night for some of you? You were at church again. How about Wednesday night, Tuesday night, or whatever that midweek service? Some of you were raised in a culture when every time there was an opportunity, you guys were there at a service with your family and relatives. There might be some of you that that's not what was normal as you were growing up. So perhaps being brought into that faith is something that is interesting to you. And that's what we're going to find out in the story of Ruth. And there's another thing that we're going to learn. Is that since we talked about Jonah, we had this big thing and we called it the relentless grace of God. We're going to learn another aspect of God's amazing grace. Not only is his grace relentless, as we reminded you over and over week to week, there's another big theme that we've been uh, saying on a regular basis. And you see it on some of the signs. You saw it. Uh, you probably see it outside as well. The theme that we're going for this year is we're saying that you matter. And when we say that you matter, what we're actually saying is not just that you matter, but every aspect of your life matters. The direction that you're headed, that matters. The choices that you make, they matter. The idea that you are in need of rescue, that matters. And so as we encapsulate all those ideas, that is the theme that we want to hear over and be reminded to where you not only hear it, but that you feel it and that you embrace it in the very deepest part of our being. But I would imagine that if, if somebody is walking by and they come and they see the sign and they see, well, the paradox, what does that mean? Sundays at 7, there's a website on there. And then in those big letters, you matter. I wonder if they just kind of put that together and say, well, that idea of me mattering, that is a paradox. I'm not sure if I really believe that. I'm not sure if that's really true. And so when you think about those two short words, and somebody would say that to you or you would see that on a sign, maybe you'd be the kind of person that would say, I won't believe it until I see it. Or kind of, I won't believe it until I actually feel that. Because I'm not sure if I felt like I've mattered to many people. Well, some of the things that we do is just when something is very important to us and when it does matter, we actually invest a good amount of time. When something matters to us, uh, there's another thing that we do as well, is we put our money where our mouth is. Did anybody get to go to the Wisconsin game last week? Okay, Corey, got a few people that, okay. Now, if you had already tickets for the game, that meant, you know, to go to the game, you're going to enjoy an incredible night game. There's going to be a great atmosphere and environment. Now, if you did not already have tickets, what was the ballpark for the price of the, of the, of the football tickets? 150. 150? That's probably on the low end, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you wanted to get some really good seats, you're going to have some, some prices yeah. in the hundreds. Okay? So if it really mattered to you to go to the game, it's going to cost you. And you're going to have to dig deep. And you're going to say, what am I going to sacrifice to make sure that I go to this night game? And you see, when things are a priority and when they do matter, we're going to show it. And there's going to be some evidence with the amount of time we put into it or the things that, that we show kind of financially. Does it matter? And is it a priority? And so when we do see a sign like that, you matter. Somebody might say, well, will you back it up? And here's what we're going to find in the story of Ruth. That not only is, is there going to be this message that Ruth matters, and there are going to be other characters in your story that matters, but God's going to take his grace to a whole other level. He's going to show that his grace is not only relentless, but that he's willing to pay the price, and that he's going to prove it, and that he's going to back it up. 
And so over the next couple of weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to learn about the redeeming grace of God. So not only is his grace relentless, and he continues to give us chance after chance, and he pursues us, but he's willing to pay the price and to back it up not only with his words, but with his actions. So let me pray, and then we're going to get into the book of Ruth. Uh, if you want to grab a Bible, we have some Bibles provided for you. I believe we're going to be on page 195 is where we're at in the blue Bibles. So you can grab one of those or if you have your own Bible. But let me pray and then we'll get started. Uh, God, we want to say thanks for an opportunity to look at your word. We've been reminded of your relentless grace. Now we're going to learn that it's even greater than we imagined. There's a redeeming aspect to your grace. That you're willing to pay the price for us. That you're willing to back it up not only with words, but with actions. And we're going to get a glimpse of that today in the story of Ruth. And it gives us a, a, a glimpse of a bigger picture of your redeeming grace. That's going to be found through Jesus at the cross. So God, I pray that you would just uh, soften our hearts. That you would just clear our minds and that you would allow us to hear from you. From this story in this book of Ruth. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you grab the Bible, don't believe we have the words up there for you tonight. So blue Bibles are there for you. It is page 195, is that correct? Okay, 195. We're going to start with Ruth, chapter 1. We're going to do the first couple verses here. And it says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, they went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. So these opening verses, they're going to essentially set the context for us. They're going to give us a little bit of the historical picture. Opening verses basically say, in this time of the judges, actually, uh, in the Bible, we actually have an entire book called the Book of Judges. And in there, it's going to record this uh, the history of God's people. God's people had been rebellious. They had been turning in the opposite direction. We had learned a little bit about Jonah's rebellion, but now we're getting a picture of the, this entire people, this entire nation. They're going to be rebelling towards God and moving in an opposite direction. And so during this time of the Judges, probably about 1400 B.C. to about 1000 B.C., that what's going to be happening is God's people, they're going to be turning away from God. God's going to bring down his discipline. And there are going to be other nations that are going to put God's people into bondage, into slavery. And so when the times get rough, what do we do? We cry out to God. And that's what they did as well. So as they cried out to God, God would answer and he would deliver and bring them uh, a judge. The judge would be a person that would lead the people into a time of peace. And once the peace had kind of uh, affected the people for a while, they would just kind of go back to their old ways. You see, there wasn't just this deep heart change. And so what would happen is when there's not a big deep change of heart, not a deep change of mind, you kind of go back to the same mess. And so the people would go back to the old things that they did. And so their, their situation would go from worse to where they would cry out. God would respond and they would bring a judge. There would be this time of freedom. And then when they went back, they would go back into bondage. The book of Judges actually records this cycle of time and time again, of getting into this mess crying out, God delivering them, them forgetting their commitments, forgetting their promises, going back into bondage. And it shows that in this cycle, the people got worse and worse and worse and worse. And one of the verses in Judges pretty much says, and they were without this leader, they were without a king, and the people did whatever they wanted to do. And so we get this picture that the people didn't really want to have this deep change all they wanted was a temporary fix. They just wanted to get out of their mess. And so things got from bad to worse. And so not only was there this spiritual climate that was getting worse, there was also the climate. There was actual famine in the land. 
And so when there's going to be a famine, there's going to be food that is going to be hard to find. There's going to be some economic issues. There's probably going to be some stress in the family. And so what would they do? How would they respond? And we get here that, that uh, this man named Elimelech, that his family of four with his wife and his two sons, they're going to respond and they're going to move away from home. They're going to go to Moab. And as they go, the, uh, go you got to recognize Bethlehem is where home is. And so as they go to Moab, now they're going to be surrounded by a culture. They're going to be surrounded by a people that have different priorities. They're going to be serving different gods. When things get desperate and they need to cry out, they're, going to not, they're not going to cry out to the same God that Jonah would worship. They're going to cry out to other gods. And so that's a little bit of the picture of what's happening in those first couple verses. And then it gets worse. It says it here in verse 3. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah. Don't get that confused with Oprah, but we're going to see some similarities a little bit later. So, yeah, I'll come back to that. These Moabite women, one named Orpah, and the other is named Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. And then what happens? Mala and Killian, they also die. And so Naomi's going to be left without her sons and her husband. So now get the picture. Imagine being at home. There's a famine in the land, and your way to respond is to go to where you think things are going to get better. And so this family of four moves from home, uproots, leaves their neighbors, leaves their friends, leaves their community of faith, goes to a culture that is surrounding them that has different priorities, has a different God that they serve, and now dad's gone. And not only is dad gone, but the sons are gone. So imagine how Naomi must be feeling. Some of you know what it feels like to suffer loss from friends and family. Naomi has attended the funeral of her husband. Now she's attended the very funeral of her two sons. She's in a culture that is a man-centered culture that makes it very difficult for those that are going to be widows. She's by herself. As a widow does not have a, a high social status, she's unprotected, she's vulnerable, and who's her company? Who's going to be her rescue? Who's going to help her out of this situation? All she has is her daughters-in-law. That's what's left. And so in this situation, things went bad to worse to unthinkable. And that's the story we get here. There's a lot of bad news that, that begins in this story of Ruth. And so her husband made a decision, and this is what he did. Now what's Ruth going to do? Ruth's going to do this. And I, and I like the picture that we have painted here. A picture of what it's like to be coming home. Because that's going to be the, the response that Naomi's going to do. She went to Moab, but Moab is, is not really home. Home's over here. And so she's going to make that journey back. Well, I want to give you guys a second to kind of introduce at your tables. Because there's a big shift of the story that happens right now when Naomi comes back home. And so at your tables... I want you to take a minute, if you didn't get to meet some people, or if there's a table that needs to combine a little bit, you might slide over and say hello. we got some visitors, we got some friends from out of town. But here's the, the, the question that can get you guys thinking and starting. What is it about home that makes you smile? Is it some food? Is it being able to come home and bring the laundry? Is it coming home and that you can just relax and you can take off your shoes? There's a comfortable chair. What is it about home that just brings a smile to your face? So just a couple minutes at your tables, kind of meet somebody new or say hello to the people across the table. What is it about home that makes you smile? Go ahead and do that for a minute here. Yeah. 
So that's something I look forward to when I come home. Mom does some awesome pumpkin rolls. You guys haven't had her pumpkin rolls? Maybe I'll just remind you when, when I come home and get another batch of those. But they're excellent. How about at this table back here? 
Anybody else want to share? What's something that makes you smile when you, when you think of home? A sense of security. Sense of security. Okay, nice. Sometimes it could be family. It could be friends. Maybe at home is this idea where you can just relax and be yourself. Sense of comfort. Sense of comfort. Right? So there's this picture of maybe what we crave or maybe what we hope for. And maybe sometimes going home there's a little bit of stress and a little bit of drama when you go home. That sometimes plays into the picture as well. But we hope that when we go home, there's a, a way that we can relax, that we can be ourselves, and there's something that we smile, and something that we look forward to. Well, in this story, this is where it takes a very big twist, because Naomi is now getting ready to head home. After the funerals, after the loss of her husband, after the love, loss of her sons, now the choice is how is she going to respond, and her choice is... It's time to come back home. And so it picks up. Let me read these verses here. This is verse uh, 6. It says that in God's time of discipline to the people, where there was this famine, that now the Lord had come to the aid of his people, and now he's provided food to them. Naomi and the daughters-in-law prepared to return home. The daughters-in-law she left the place where she had been living and set out on this road that was going to take them back, on this road that was going to be leading them back home. And then on the way, there's this realization from Naomi. She really has nothing to offer her daughters-in-law. Because you see, in that culture, the family would take, take care of each other when there was a loss of life in the family. And so she thought, there, I'm too old to go and find a husband, and for that husband to have sons, that way they would marry you, and that you guys would be protected. And I really appreciate your concern and your love that you're going to come and journey back home with me. But she says this, you guys go back. This is verse 8. Go back, each of you, to your mother's home, and may the Lord show kindness to you as you've shown to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. And here's how they respond. They basically say, no, we'll go back. We'll go back with you, and we're going to go back to, to your people. And he only presents that dilemma. No, no, I'm too old. It's not going to work out. And after she says that, there's this one situation, but from the two daughters-in-law, you're going to see two different responses. Orpah says in verse 14 that she kissed her mother-in-law and she said goodbye. What was Orpah going to do? She was going to go back home. And then we get this very different picture of what Ruth is going to do. Ruth clings and holds on to Naomi. And Naomi says this in verse 15. Look, your sister-in-law, she's actually going back home. But do you see what she adds to that? She's going back to her people, and she's going back to her gods. Those things that she would depend on, those things that she would rescue, she's actually going back to her home and that culture and the gods that she serves. Why don't you go back with her? And maybe you've heard this. These verses are very powerful verses. I've heard them at, 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 at weddings. I've heard them in sermons. But this is Ruth, Ruth's reply. Verse 16. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates me from you. Naomi realizes that Ruth's not going to let go. And Ruth makes it very clear. She makes it very clear, I know what used to be home, but I'm going to take a step in this direction. I'm not sure what it's going to look like. I'm not sure about all the details. But where you say is home, I'm going to begin this journey with you. And I'm coming back to a new home. Not, not the old home, 
over here. Not with Orpah and the gods that she's going to serve and that I used to serve. I'm going this direction. And I'm coming. I'm coming home. Now this week as I was trying to, to wrestle and think through that idea of coming home, and just even at the tables as we were able to share for a moment, maybe you had to think a little bit, what is it about home that makes you smile? Because maybe some of you thought of your hometown. Some of you thought about the home here in the Columbus area. It's an apartment. It's a house. It's a place that you now call home. But maybe when that word home, for some of us, it's, I think, something that we crave. We would love to go home and for everything to be fixed and all right and things to be all put together. And for some of us, when we do think of home, it's not something that brings a smile to our face. It's actually something that makes us cringe. Because there's something that's broken. There's something that you don't look forward to. There's a relationship that's not the way it should be. Maybe you go home and you remember, like Naomi, her husband's no longer going to be there. That her sons are no longer going to be there. So this trip and this journey home is going to be very different than what it used to be. When Kelly and I get opportunities to head home to see my mom and dad and her mom and dad, we enjoy those times, we enjoy those moments, we don't need to go back as much as we'd like to. But we enjoy that time and we also enjoy the home that we started here in Columbus. But that does make me think, are there moments that we do cringe when we think of home? Is there something deep down that we really crave? I wish home was like this. I wish when I came after school or after work or after church or whatever time that I could just sit down and be myself. That I could just relax. That I know that I belong. That I know that I matter. That I wouldn't feel judged. That I, that I could just be myself, that I can open up even about things that, that trouble me, things that I wrestle with. Now, just thinking about this picture of coming home, it, it just reminded me of that, that idea of a paradox, of that tonight we gather together and we get to hear about the story of Ruth and how her story is going to change when she comes home. But there's this also this idea of spiritually coming home. Because maybe you really connect with Naomi. You're raised in a culture and in a family where you went to church on Sunday and on Sunday night or on Wednesday. And you remember a time when your faith felt like it was on fire. But there was this season when you just kind of went off and it was away from that spiritual home. And maybe like Naomi, now that you've come back, Things are completely different. You wonder what it's going to be like when you come back. What is God going to say? What is God going to do? There's things that I've done. There's ways that I am different. Or maybe tonight as you think about coming home, there's this craving that you wish you could get this new season and this new start where things would be put together, things would be healed, and things would be exciting, and you would look forward to that weekend trip. Or you would look forward to those holidays and coming to see family and friends. I wonder what it would be like, too, for, for the students and the young adults around this community that they would know that there's this spiritual home on Sunday nights and on Sunday mornings and right within this building where regardless of how far they've wandered, that there's, there's an opportunity for them to come back home and there's going to be a group of people that are ready to welcome them home, to learn their names, to hear their stories. And that's a little bit what we're going to be doing this weekend. If you have an opportunity, Friday and Saturday night, we're going to be having our first retreat. We're going to be hearing some stories. And I pray it's going to be an opportunity where we can just be ourselves around the campfire. And he's going to be leading us in some songs. I mean, we're going to listen to each other's stories and be able to share and go just a little bit deeper. 
There are opportunities during the week where you can get into smaller groups and where we can go into the Bible, but also hear each other's story and how they connect and relate with the stories that we see in Scripture. And then on Sunday morning, as well as Sunday night, we can come together and hear the stories of God and how they connect and relate with us. Imagine what it would be like if the community that is outside on this block or blocks from here or on the dorms or, or wherever on campus, that they would know that there's a place waiting for them when they make that journey back home. And that maybe there would be a new season in front of them. A season that they crave and a season that they hope for. At the end of these verses, we just kind of summarize it. When Naomi comes back, she has gone through some craziness. She has seen the loss of some very close loved ones. And when she comes home, people actually recognize something is different and something is wrong with her. And the people actually say, what happened to you? And Naomi says this, you know what? Don't even call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. Maybe some of them took her up on it. They say, we're not just going to call you bitter, but now we're going to call you the bitter witch. Because you seem like you're always grumpy. It seems, like, But we don't know the story of what happened and the loss. And maybe your journey comes coming home is you're going to say, wow, I never expected for myself to go so far or for to look and to feel so much different than when I left Man, what a homecoming that would be if on that road and on that journey home, there's this whole new season and there's this whole new life that's ahead of you. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to unpack that. Because Ruth and Naomi are going to come home. But that first step for them was responding and making that step in that direction to come back. And so tonight, maybe that's one of the first steps that you need to do, is make a step in that direction. And if you've already made that step, you've already made that choice to come home, maybe what you can do in the upcoming days and the upcoming weeks is that you can bring a friend with you as you make that spiritual journey home. Whether that be in a life group, whether that be on the retreat, or whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night. But this chapter ends with the harvest season ready to begin. Because one season was over, and now there was this new season coming ahead. And I think for Naomi, she didn't know what was ahead. For Ruth, she was hoping that there would be something exciting and different. And she was ready to say, you know what? This used to be home, but now this is going to be my new home. And so that would be my prayer for each of us. That we would take a step to come home, or if we're already on that journey of coming home and becoming closer to God, that we would invite someone into that story as well. So let me pray, and the band's going to come up. We're going to do some closing songs. We're going to celebrate with communion. But I'm going to pray here. God, I want to say thanks for Ruth's story. Now that I think of it, there was a lot of bad news that happened in the opening verses of this, this book. But before we see much of the good news, we realize that there is so much desperation and that we're in need of rescue. And Ruth and Naomi find themselves in the same place. And God, we are in need of rescue. And God, we thank you that you have relentless grace and you are a relentless God. And that you are excited. And that you are prepared. And that you've already paid the price for us to come home. And as we sing and prepare for communion, we get to reflect that you have backed up your words with action. How you went to the cross. Paid the price. Your life so that we could find true life. And for that we want to say thanks. We ask all this. In Jesus' name.